I added the Rust projects to this class, which I think will be helpful. Um, and I believe I can use my local Linux machine for this. We're going to see, even though it's ARM-based, I don't think that's going to be a problem for this, these projects the way it was last time. And by the way, if you have a local Linux machine, I prefer to connect by SSH so it's easier to control the input and cut and paste things in and such. So I do SSH. All right. It's my uh, Debian at 192. 168, 121, 139. This is how you control cloud machines, usually. All right, so I don't need this console. This is my Debian machine. And uh, all right, I'm gonna, I've already, good, I see I've already done some stuff on here, which is not bad. All right, I'm gonna just uh, make a dir, uh, CS demo and go in there. All right, now I got an empty directory. All right, so let's try shooting some Rust in here and compare it to C, and that's the point of these projects. So, uh, Rust is already installed on this machine. There's the commands to install it, and here's hello world in Rust. So this will make a working directory um, I'm just using, by the way, I've just followed a Rust tutorial which told me to always make a directory and always put every project in a separate directory, which is what you do for a real project that will have many modules. In fact, there's, you can, if you only have one source module, there are simpler ways to do it, but I'm just following this procedure because it's the first one I learned. So this is hello world in Rust. You have fn to define a function. You define a function main, which is the same as c. The main routine is where it starts. And then I just do a print statement. Rust says hello. And it does this print line bang. It's just the format. So it's pretty close to c and other languages. I save this. And then I compile it with Rust c, hello.rs. And that compiles it. And now I do, dots, uh, I do ls minus l to see what's in this directory. This is the source code, 46 bytes. This is the compiled file, which is much bigger, which is the executable. So I just run it, and it says, Rust says hello. So all this does is show I have Rust working and the simplest format. But now we're going to see why it is useful. So one thing to know about is uh, that there are, uh, okay, I don't want to do that. I want to do, let's see where I am. I want to cd dot dot. And then I want to do this much. All right, this will do it to keep, keep my new demonstrations in a different folder than my old ones. All right, so here's code. Now, when you use variables in Rust, you may recall in Python, you just set a equals 1, and Python will figure out it's an integer. Um, but if you make 1 over 2, it'll turn it into a floating point variable. Uh, this is pretty sloppy stuff. In Rust, you define what the variable type is. You don't have to. But you usually do, and it makes it much better. So I tell it this is an unsigned 32-bit integer. And this one is going to be a default, which I think is a signed integer. Then I'm going to print those out. So let's do that, and now compile it. And now it won't let me continue, because this is wrong. I made an unsigned integer, so it goes from 0 up to 32 ones, and you can't put a negative number in there. This is the kind of thing you could do in C, and it would lead you into a world of pain. You can't do it in Rust. This is why I say programmers have consistently made Rust their number one language of choice. It will tell you when something is wrong, so you fix your code. So you don't end up shipping buggy code and creating a world of suffering. One thing I've been told by developers is if you catch something during design, it costs a certain amount of time and effort. But if, you have, if it gets bounced by quality control later and you have to rework it, it costs 10 times as much. And if it gets all the way to the customer and you have to have a recall and a patch, that costs 100 times as much. So you really want to catch your bugs early. It's much better for everybody <laughs> to get, fix them before they go out and create a public relations disaster and vulnerability reports and all that nonsense. All right, so I'm just checking. There's nothing new in the uh, Twitch chat. All right, so that's, that's a clue. All right, so now we're going to add some numbers. Um, so let me do this. Again, I'll go up here and then run that stuff and then put in another program here. All right, so I let A equals 1, then A equals A plus 1, and then I print the output. 
So let's see what happens here. I do rust C, add. Again, I can't do it twice because by default, variables are immutable, which remember we talked about earlier in this class, some of the Python data types are also immutable. They can hold data, but you cannot change the data in those data types. Uh, lists are good because everything is mutable, but the other data types we talked about, like tuples, are immutable. So that's another thing to be aware of. All right, and now let's do an integer overflow um, in C. This is where you get to C. The reason you'd bother with Rust, so far it's a little bit nicer than other languages, but nothing special. But this is what makes it something special. If I nano ovc dot c. All right, this is a program you might have. This is C, so I import an I.O. library. Now I define an unsigned character, x equals 230. Now you should already be getting upset about this. I've got used to this over decades, but this is complete garbage. A character variable should contain a character, like A, B, or C. Now what's it doing containing a number? And even if it's gonna contain a number, in American, it, the um, vi Printable numbers only go from 0 to 127. 230 is not a valid ASCII character. So any way you look at it, a character variable should not be able to hold anything like 230. That doesn't really make any sense. But in C, characters are just stored as single byte integers. So you can put any number from 0 to 255 in them. And I was so used to that. That was the standard for all programming languages until about 20 years ago. So I learned that for all the languages until I couldn't think of anything else. And that's what we're going to start with 230. And now we're just going to add numbers to it for a while. We'll add 1, add 2, add 3, and so on, and print it out. So let's do that. And you compile C here. All right, so I compile it. And uh, let me make this a little taller to make sure it's getting on the uh, broadcast part of it. Okay, now I run it, OVC. All right, so what happens is it starts at 231, then I make it bigger, 233, 236, 251. Then it wraps around like an odometer back to two and goes 10 and 19. Now that's, it's an eight bit number. So when you add numbers above 255, the highest bit rolls over into the next byte and is thrown away and it gets small again. Now this is cruel. How is a developer you poor developer, you people are going to be developers. How are you supposed to know this is going to happen to you? You start with a number, you add a number to it, and you're supposed to know, oh, it might wrap around and get small. In fact, as you might imagine, even though people say, well, you should understand that, people will frequently not understand that. Especially if you think about the real development of code, where you write a module, and then years later, somebody else writes another routine to add to it. That developer is gone, some new guy comes in, and they add something, and pretty soon you've gone too high, and nobody ever noticed. This happens all the time. So this is a serious problem, um, and this does not happen in Rust. Here's exactly the same program in Rust. And the code looks very much the same. You define an unsigned 8-bit integer that's 230. It doesn't call it a character because that's stupid, but it is an unsigned 8-bit integer. And now I'm just going to make a for loop and add numbers to it and print them out. So when you run this, Rust compile um, their thing, and then I run it. It runs until it hits 251, and then it stops and tells you attempt to add with overflow. So it won't let you finish the program and ship it with a mistake like that in it. It will instead stop and say, wait, you made a variable and only hold numbers up to 255 and you tried to put a bigger number in there. I won't do it. This is much, much friendlier. You know you've made a mistake. So that's, uh, and the other one is the one I, I demonstrated in some detail last time, the string overflow. Here's an example of this. Um, so here's a C program with a string overflow. Let me get it to here. Okay, there it is. So what this is going to do, let me get up to the start of it. Okay, it's going to define two strings that are long enough to hold five characters. The first one has AAAA, the next one has BBBB, and it's going to just print them out along with the locations where they're stored in memory, and then it's going to get new value for string two, and you can put in anything you want, and then it'll just print them out again. That's all it does. So we can see how strings are stored and what happens when you change the content of strings. So we compile it here and then run it. Okay, so enter new value for string two. If I put in C, 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 right now string one contains A's and string two contains B's. If I put in four C's, then string one contains A and string two contains C's. So everything's fine. 
Nothing has gone wrong. Now notice the addresses. This one is stored at the address 7E8, and this one is stored at the address 7E0. So the difference between these two is only eight bytes. They're packed in real close to each other because it doesn't need more room than that to store something that's only four letters long. But if I put in more than four letters, here's 20. So I redefine string two to contain this. And now what happens is string one contains a bunch of C's and string two contains a bunch of C's. This is because the way C makes this thing it calls strings, it stores bytes and then it puts a null byte at the end for the terminator. So I have overridden the terminator. So even though there's only room for four characters or five characters, I've now got something that goes on for 20 characters. And what's even worse, and what I think is even crueler to the developer, is I asked for new value for string two, but it changed string one. Now, how are you supposed to know this is gonna happen? How are you supposed to cope with that? I say input one variable and it changes another variable. This is really, really cruel. And this is you know, the general uh, property of uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. The way things are stored in memory is not smart enough in C. It's, old, it's very tied to the hardware and machine language, and it's not very connected to a human understanding of what a string should be. A string should be a series of characters, not bytes, and if you put a longer string in there, it should just allocate more memory. It shouldn't overrun and hit some other variable. Um, but this, you know, C is a very old language, written in 79, when it was necessary to be very fast, and it was intended to be an easier way to write assembly language, essentially. It assumed people really understood the hardware, right down to the bits and bytes. But they don't anymore, and really, why should they? So let's make the string app in C. This is an app that does the same thing, or in Rust, pardon me. It does the same thing. It defines a string, AAA, and it makes it mutable so it can be changed. Four A's and four B's, then it prints out the values, then it enters a new value for string one. You change one of them, so I rush to see that. And I run it. All right, so now if I put in CCCC for string one. Now, right now, string one contains A's and string two contains B's. Notice the address. This one is stored at 620. This one is at 638. So it's a little further away than C put it, but it's not really very far away. It's only 24 bytes away, 16 plus 8. Uh, 20 to 38. So I put in four C's, and now what it did is it added them to the end of the A's instead of replacing it, which is a minor wrinkle. But the main thing is I added C's to A and it didn't change B. So that was only four of them, though. What happens if I put in a lot of them? Like 20, like I did before. Then it works. String one gets the C's, string two does not get any. And notice the addresses. Um, String one was here. Now string one is F90, and this one is FA8. They're still not very far apart, but the reason this works, and if you do the project and use the debugger in C, is that it doesn't actually store the strings literally this address. It uses two layers of indirection. At this address is a pointer to where the string is, and it changes that pointer to someplace that has enough room, which is a much smarter way to do it. With very minimal cost in time and memory, it's more flexible. It can put a bigger object in where a smaller object was without causing these collisions of data that lead to the maddening problems, the security problems that we've all been suffering with for 40 or 50 years. Anyway, um, let me check for comments in the Twitch. There are no new ones. All right, and uh, you can use GDB to see how it's stored internally, but I'm not gonna bother with that. And uh, then there's command injection. Two, we can try, I don't think I'll bother demonstrating that one. That one's a little screwy. That one you can't save yourself from with Rust. So there's some problems that Rust will not fix. And if you want to look at a few others, which I think are quite relevant to this class, of some of the more advanced flaws, you can do this R20. Now, dangling pointers and memory leaks are other common problems um, in programs. A dangling pointer goes like this. You have, here we're going to create a heap overflow in C. I think I'll make this one, and we'll see how it goes. All right. Um, there. So let's go up here and nano hippo, uh, o dot c. Okay, and we've been talking about this as we were talking about linked lists. The heap is where you put data that you're gonna use temporarily. So here, you use malloc. Malloc is the command to allocate space on the heap. This is a space you dynamically allocate while the program runs to store data, and then you can 
deallocate it later. So you can handle a program that handles a lot of data, like network traffic coming in. So I, I dynamically allocate root for 20 characters here and 20 characters here, call it name one and name two. Then I read them from the, the user, and then I print out those values and the addresses. That's all this does. Now, um, all right, so this is going to be heap overflow, and so I'll compile it and run it. Okay. Okay, so if I put in name one A A A A and name two B B B B, then they're perfectly fine. Name one is, is dynamically puts it here at two A zero. It puts the other one at two C zero, so they're separated by thirty two bytes of memory, and it stores them there A A A B B. And this is in fact a linked list with pointers to the next item and the previous item, just like the kind you've had. But the problem is, I can put in something longer. So if I put in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then it still works. That was 20 characters. Let's try a longer one. If I put in 40 and 40, now I get a disaster. Look at what name on one is turned into. It's got A's, then it's got the B's, then it's got the name of the variable, name one, then a colon, because the name of the variable is also stored somewhere in memory, and it totally overrode the memory allocated for storing variables, and it hit the memory used to store the names of variables. Think what madness that is. Your variable names normally do not appear anywhere in the actual calculation. Here's what's what name two turned into. Name two has the B's, then name two, then another copy of the B's, then address, and so on. It's got all sorts of junk in here. It's amazing what a disaster it is when you overflow objects in the heap. So that's pretty gruesome. And as you'd expect, this does not happen in Rust. Rust will automatically reallocate space as needed to uh, make to uh, store the strings no matter how long they get. Um, and here's a dangling pointer. A dangling pointer is another problem caused by C. If you allocate space, so I define something called name one and I allocate it, and then I free it. This is the way you're supposed to use it. You allocate space, and when you're done using it, you free it so that memory can be used again. But if I allocate this space and I forget to free it, then when this module is done running, another module can still refer to that memory, which is no longer reserved for this purpose, and may be used for a different purpose. So I might be able to pin in data that will be sent into memory, into a region of memory that is now being used for a different purpose. And that's another form of memory corruption. So you can... Uh, see what happens here. Um, all right, so the, the value entered in name two overwrites name one. And that's what happened here. Down here, I printed name one even after it had been freed. See, in C, there are three things you have to do. You have to allocate something, then you have to free it, and then you have to set it to null. So it can't be used anymore. And if you forget to do those three things in the right order, you leave a dangling pointer that points to memory that is no longer allocated for that purpose. So I was able to print it down here because I didn't set this to null. This is crazy, and by the way, I should mention how beautifully Rust solves this. The way Rust does it, you allocate it with this box new statement, and the rule is, as soon as it falls out of scope, you define it within this module with the curly braces. As soon as you pass this curly brace, it automatically deletes that, that heap memory. So you don't manually free it, and you don't manually null it. It automatically does that when you're done using it, which is so much smarter. So you can't make a mistake and forget to free it or free it twice, both of which lead to security disasters. So that's what I wanted to show you, the joy of Rust. Uh, it's stuff you can do for extra credit, and I think it would be good for you. So I'm going to stop this recording.